I want to double click on micro vessels a little bit more and extract some information from that from that brain of yours. So at a very high level, when you say micro vessels, what we're talking about here are you you said arterioles. So arterioles, which is uh, kind of the end part of the artery system that's bringing blood towards some type of tissue, capillaries, and then uh, venules. Venules, yeah. Right. So the capillaries are connecting the arterioles and the venules. Yes. Okay, and that's that's where the uh, nutrient exchange kind of takes place. Mm -hmm. Right. So the blood's flowing through the arterioles into the capillaries, it's bringing um, nutrients and other important compounds and then the metabolic kind of byproducts, waste products are carried away from the tissue from venules? Yeah, in, in venules which then coalesce into larger veins. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then carry it back mm -hmm. to central circulation. So you said a few times these are really, really, really small. So how how do you study those? I know you said you cannulate them. What does that mean? How do we actually look inside some type of blood vessel that's thinner than a strand of human hair? Well, if we're looking at the blood vessel itself, we, we can dissect it out. So with practice working under a dissection microscope with very fine... Um, dissection instruments, you can dissect it away from tissue. Is these, another way of thinking of these small or microcircuitry blood vessels, uh, they're the ones that are inside the tissue. Um, so you've got to get it away from the tissue to be, able to, to be able to look at it. And we simply dissect it out, and when I say cannulate, we're taking small glass tubes and we're putting those glass tubes into the inside of the blood vessel or the lumen, and then we take very fine suture and tie the blood vessel down onto that tube. And we do that at both ends. Um, so you've got this cannulated vessel connected to two bits of glass, which are then connected to pressure reservoirs to um, keep a static pressure within the within the blood vessel and we can change that blood, that pressure. And we've spoken about some of the downstream, I guess, complications from microvascular dysfunction in people with diabetes. So we spoke about neuropathy, retinopathy. What about uh, outside of the setting of diabetes? Um, if you have dysfunction of, of these small vessels supplying the heart tissue or skeletal muscle, presumably we're seeing other complications in that setting. Yes, we're, we're learning more and more ab about that. Um, you know, uh, cardiac events, you think of obstruction of blood vessels. Um, in the coronary circulation is is leading to some plaque being disrupted and then going down and um, blocking the small vessels. But it's it's now realised that in a lot of cases, when people come in with chest pain and they have to go to the catheterization laboratory to to be studied to to look to see whether they should have a stent or something to unblock the arteries that a lot of people don't have any evidence of a blockage or a significant blockage. And it's thought what hap is happening is that there's dysfunction of the downstream microvessels and they're becoming over-contractile. And, um, Which means they're constricting constrict. more yeah. than they would in a physiologic setting. Yes. So in a pathophysiologic and, setting, they are tightening. Yeah. So that you end up with... Um, angina or ischemic pain within within the heart because you're not delivering the tissue which is active enough for and enough nutrients. So what's the what's the working hypothesis that would explain 
why these uh, small vessels that are kind of infiltrating heart tissue would constrict? Does that come back to the function and health of the larger blood vessels? I know you've spoken to me previously about like the stiffness of the big arteries affecting the small blood vessels. This is probably a more functional um, constriction within the blood vessels. So that's going to occur in small arteries or arterioles just above the capillaries. And it's probably occurring because there's some sort of uh, dysfunction of the endothelium. Either it's inability to make a dilator like nitric oxide or that it's making an excessive amount of a vasoconstrictor, which constricts the blood vessels as opposed to dilates them. What would potentially explain why that's happening? Is that is that age-related? It changes? Is it genetics? Is there some type of modifiable risk factor like you know, inflammation or insulin resistance? You know, why, why would that be happening? Well, it's probably a mixture of many, many things, but there um, is certainly likely to be a uh, inflammatory um, <clears throat> um, reactive oxygen species sort of uh, uh, environment that's that's in causing causing it. So some of those uh, are potentially modified through modifiable through lifestyle. Can you get blockages in these small vessels? So we often hear, pretty much always hear, that atherosclerosis, you know, it's occurring in the carotid or coronary artery, and they're much bigger in terms of diameter. Mm -hmm. Now, presumably, this whole system, all the way from the big arteries down to the arterioles, are exposed to the same kind of ApoB containing lipoproteins or um, LDL cholesterol, the same inflammatory proteins. And I think if you were to kind of hypothesize without knowing everything about the system, you would think block blockages would probably first occur in the tiny, tiny vessels that have a much smaller diameter. Um, but then there's different environments in terms of pressure. So like what... What, what explains why we see atherosclerosis in bigger arteries, not in arterioles? Well, there can be a number of uh, different reasons, but the physical forces and the flow patterns are different in those larger blood vessels. So there are areas of the circulation that are more susceptible to the development of atherosclerotic plaque. Um, <clears throat> I think in reality that you probably going to be seeing a mix of these two things, that there is atherosclerotic development. It's just not at a point of um, yeah, critical blockage. It's not explaining the angina. What you're saying is in some cases the angina Ye yes. is explained by the kind of collapse. Can you, is, that, is that an appropriate no, term? No, it's, it's not collapse. It's an active constriction. Active constriction. Yeah. But subconscious. <laughs> Yes, you've got no control over it. Mm -hmm, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but you, you, you likely see interactions that are occurring too between the, the small vessels of the heart and the larger vessels so that if you get this enhanced constriction of the uh, um, microcirculation, it, it wouldn't be surprising if that changes the pressure and flow patterns up, upstream Um which could uh, make vulnerable plaque or plaque that's more likely to come off. So are there drugs that people are testing or have been clinically studied that could modulate that or uh, attenuate some of that constriction? Um, yeah, people can take vaso vasodilators. Um, but in terms of... Um, more specifically doing it, I mean, there are, are trials that are going on that are looking at blocking anti-inflammatory events, for example. This probably also uh, gets to the question that I often see from people that uh, I think take the position that LDL cholesterol or ApoB-containing proteins aren't really a problem. Um, 
which is certainly a kind of anti-consensus position, I would say. Uh, they they often say, well, why why don't we see blockages occurring in the venous system? Why don't veins get atherosclerosis? <laughs> and I'm sure, given your research into the pressure differences in 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 vessels, that's something that you've come across. Well, the pressures and the the hemodynamic profiles are very different, but the cells are also very different. If you um, if if you if you do a uh, um, some some sort of screening profile where you look at the the makeup of the endothelial cells, and the en- endothelium on a um, a vein is is different from the endothelium on an artery, so. To assume that something, because it happens in one part of the circulation and should happen in all parts of the circulation, is it, it's doubtful. I have read some interesting um, papers which maybe speak to it being more about the pressure um, where they've taken a graft, a venous graft, and inserted that in where there was a, a blockage in the arterial system and watched over time. And at least in s- certain case studies, patients can develop plaque uh, if that, uh, that vein is exposed to the pressure of the arterial system, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, certainly when you look at a, uh, a vein to artery growth, there's uh, an adaption that occurs in, in, the, in the, that venous graft. Um, it can become more prone to atherosclerosis. It can can become more prone to um, abnormal growth patterns. Um, smooth muscle cells that are in the wall of blood vessels are, are fascinating cells. <clears throat> Normally, they're they're what we call contractile, but under certain um, certain conditions, something stimulates them to change to a, a synthetic or a, a growing type phenotype. They don't become, or they lose their contractile ability, but uh, <clears throat> they cause a hyperplastic response within the blood vessel wall. In what ways do these small blood vessels um, interact or talk to large blood vessels? That's a, that's a fantastic question because <clears throat> you know, quite often the large vessel people talk about large vessel people and the microcirculation people talk about the microcirculation, but obviously they're connected. Would you say you're a microcirculation person or you, you've studied both? Um, <clears throat> I like to say I'm a microcirculationist, but we're, we're spending a lot of time at the moment studying large artery stiffness, which we can we can talk about later. But, you know, we were talking before about this pressure-dependent constriction that's in the small vessels and um, controlling blood flow locally. And I think I've said to you this before, if, if you start to exercise just a small part of the body and there's an, a requirement for increased nutrients within that part of the body, um, <clears throat> how do you get more blood flow there? Do you just pump more blood flow all around the body? No. Local vasodilation. You do that local vasodilation. But that gets to a point where if it's only vo- vasodilating very locally, that becomes limiting because these vessels up here are not dilated. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> you can keep dilating those and you wouldn't necessarily think about uh, um, getting more flow. But what you see is that there are uh, signals that propagate upstream within the vessel wall, um, what's called conducted vasodilation. Chemical signals. Uh, Electrical and chemical, but you may have heard of a thing called flow-mediated dilation. When you open those blood vessels in this part in a small part there, more and more activity, they dilate more. That causes an increase in shear stress 
across the endothelial cells of the larger blood vessels, which releases nitric oxide, which then causes dilation mm -hmm. and you sort of propagating the effect back upstream so that your muscle activity can increase its blood flow tens and tens of times over its basal blood flow. But you have to incorporate more and more of the circulation. So that's, that's one way I talk about um, the microvessels interacting with the, uh, mm -hmm. with the larger vessels. We were just talking about in the heart when you get uh, um, that micro microcircuitry constriction and the angina that's occurring, if it's having effects upstream because those vessels are constricted, the pressure is higher back in the coronary vessels, which may be a damaging phenomenon. So again, that's, that's an abnormal propagation. So that's dysfunction in the microvasculature having a negative consequence back upstream yes. to the larger arteries. To, yeah, to the larger coronary blood vessels. And what about the reverse? Because I know you've told me that if you have stiffness of certain large arteries supplying the heart, that can damage the small vessels indirectly. There's a, there's a lot of interest in large artery stiffness, and here are many more, the aorta. Mm -hmm.